Good evening. This time we'd like to call to order the meeting of the Belbrook City Council, October 28th, 2019. If we could please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Pam, could you please call the roll? Mr. Edwards. Here. Mr. Greenwood. Here. Mrs. Seeger Lawson. Here. Dr. Van Veldhuizen. Here. Mr. McGill. Here. Mayor Schweller. Here. Uh, Elaine's not with us yet. She was stuck in traffic, but let's have a motion to excuse her this evening. If she shows up, she may be a late, uh, late show. Can I have a motion, please? So moved. Thank you. Second. Second. A motion was made by Mr. McGill to excuse Mrs. Middlestetter from tonight's meeting. This was seconded by Mr. Edwards. Mr. McGill. Yes. Mr. Edwards. Yes. Mr. Greenwood. Yes. Mrs. Seeger Lawson. Yes. Dr. Van Beldhuizen. Yes. And Mayor Schwaller. Yes. Thank you. <clears throat> Next item is the approval of the work session and the regular meeting <laughs> minutes of October the 14th, 2019. Does any member of council have any corrections or additions? Yeah. To those minutes? None, Mayor. None. none, Mayor. Seeing done, the minutes are approved as written. Tonight are Mayor's announcements. We have one of the most uh, interesting events we do each year, which is the Beautification Awards. And this year, I'd like to have the chairs Robert and Michelle Johnson come forward and present the awards. It'll just be me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> My wife is here, but uh, she won't be joining me up here. So. Um, next slide, please. So this year is a bit of a change for the Bellbrook Beautification Award. Um, my wife and I have been on the committee for several years, but uh, Bron Wilson, who was the previous chairperson, decided to step down last year, so my wife and I took it over. So in, in addition to that change, we ha also have a few new uh, committee members. So if you're here, if you uh, would stand up. I know Becky Wick is not here. She's one of our neighbors. Sophia Briley is also a new member, and I don't see her in the audience either. But I know Bonnie Howe is here, if you would stand up. And then we have uh, Betty Ogre. And then we have my wife, who likely won't stand up. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for taking it on. It's a, it's a new change. Yep. Uh, yeah, we've, we've been involved since 2007 <coughs> or so. No, 2008, I think it was. So, um, how do we make the awards? We have uh, five sections within the city, and there, we each um, each section is assigned to a committee person, and they drive around that area and make nominations. So those select four. So they'll select four nominations for that given area, and those will all come back to us as the chair people, and we'll assemble those together, and then provide them out to the rest of the committee members, and then we all drive around Belbrook looking at homes. There's been a few times over the years that we've definitely gotten some looks as we're driving slowly by. <laughs> Why are they looking at my house? <laughs> uh, for future reference next year, you don't have to be a committee member in order to <coughs> make a nomination. Uh, if you as a citizen of Bellbrook would like to make a nomination, feel free to reach out to my wife or I, and we will add those onto the list of uh, possible nominees. If somebody, if a citizen does nominate a home, they can, um, those on the committee can either accept that or nominate four of their own, four of their own. So sometimes a, a given section may have five or more nominations. And uh, city council members and those on the committee and winners in the past five years are not eligible. Next slide. Just about. We'll go to our first home. We'll go by, uh, <coughs> by our sections. The first winners are. Michael and Joni Dingledine. I know I saw them. There they are. Um, I should have mentioned before, uh, I'll call them up in a moment to accept it, but uh, all of our award winners receive these uh, engraved rocks. We had to find a new uh, entity this year to engrave these rocks. The prior company that did those uh, no longer does it. And so this year we were able to enlist the high school STEM class. Um, their teacher, Blake Barnes, engraved these for us. They have a laser engraver at the school, and so they, uh, they came out very nicely. So, 
Our first winner, the Michael and Joan Dingleby, you come up and give you your rock and your certificate. If you'd like to say anything. <laughs> Next we have uh, 2223 South Lakeman Drive, William and Robin Wobson. Are they here today? Yes, there it is. Should recognize the hat. <laughs> <laughs> Section B, we have uh, 4035 Eckworth Drive, Alex and Diane Fabric. Right here. Okay. Our next house, and no surprise here, <laughs> we have uh, 4098 Maxwell Drive. After 30 or so years of being on the committee and therefore ineligible to win, um, first year they're eligible to win, they do win, uh, Dale and Ron Wilson. And there was no undue influence from the committee. They <laughs> <laughs> properly nominated. Well deserved. Uh, section C, 4216 Barrel Drive, James and Patricia Durate. Moving on to section C, we have, and I know they're here, uh, 1665 Cedar Court, Dale and Susan Steele. Susan was quite excited. <laughs> Moving on to uh, section D on 3588 Big Tree Road, we have Matthew and Hannah Couch and Doug and Annie Smith. Robert, they're not here tonight. They're my next door neighbors, and they moved in that house in June of 18, so it's been pretty tremendous what they've done in a very short order. Also in Section D, uh, 143 <coughs> Upper Hillside Drive, Roger and Sharon Donor, they are also prior to this. Section E, 1828 Von Havel Court, Vernon and Kristen Oakley. Okay. And our last homeowner, we have uh, 1905 Little Sugar Creek, Thomas and Vicki Craycraft. Okay. And we don't have a slide for this one, but our uh, we also nominate one business every year, and this year's winner was Bella Realty. Uh, they did a really nice job of renovating their their office right here on the corner. So very good. Thank you very much, Robert. Let's have a big round of applause for our winners. <laughs> very, very well done. Any comments from council at all? I'm just happy the Wilsons can finally win. I mean, I think yeah. they yeah. definitely yeah. dedicated a lot of time and effort to the city, so we appreciate Absolutely. that. It's a little embarrassing, but does somebody have the wrong certificate? <laughs> 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 Looks like we're missing one. Oh, are we missing? I'll, I'll check it through. Okay. Thank you. Next on the agenda is the Oath of Office, uh, Tim Tuttle, Planning Board. Tim, if you could join me at the lectern. <coughs> <coughs> There's your right hand repeat after me. I, Timothy Tuttle. I, Timothy Tuttle. Solemnly swear that I will support. Solemnly swear that I will support. The Constitution of the United States. The Constitution of the United States. 
In the Constitution of the State of Ohio. In the Constitution of the State of Ohio. And we'll obey the laws thereof. We'll obey the laws thereof. And that I will. And that I will. In all respects. In all respects. Uphold and enforce. Uphold and enforce. The provisions of the charters. The provisions and the charters. And the ordinances of Belbert. And the ordinances of Belbert. And we'll faithfully discharge the duties. And faithfully discharge the duties. Of the office upon which I'm about to enter. Of the office on which I'm about to enter. Congratulations. Thank you very much. We serve on the planning board. Timothy, you need to sign here. Cool. <laughs> and then we'll make it official. Thank you. Once again, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Next item on the agenda is a public hearing of ordinance number 2019-19. Councilman Edwards, please. Thank you, Mayor. Ordinance number 2019-19, an ordinance repealing ordinance number 2019-14 and adopting new ordinance number 2019-19 to adjust the City of Bellbrook appropriations for 2019. Whereas the City of Bellbrook adopted ordinance 2019 <laughs> 14 to adjust the city of Bellbrook appropriations for 2019 and whereas there were clerical errors in the beginning and amended appropriation lines and whereas the city of Bellbrook wishes to repeal ordinance number 2019-14 and adopt ordinance number 2019-19 and correct clerical errors now therefore the city of Bellbrook hereby ordains section 1 council hereby repeals ordinance 2019-14 to correct clerical errors and hereby adopts new ordinance number 2019-19. Section 2, that the 2019 appropriation levels and several of the funds listed below be amended as follows. And in the body of this ordinance are the various funds, the total 2019 appropriations, the revisions and the amended appropriations. I won't go through it line by line, but the 2019 appropriations, the grand total was six million. 563,677 total revisions told 171,637 and then amended 2019 appropriations are 6,735,314 section 3 this ordinance shall take effect and be enforced from and after the earliest period provided by law and I think the made we've we read this in last month, uh, last month at the last meeting, and the, the biggest changes are in the um, total general fund, 76,705, and then special revenue funds of 68,480, and then some a smaller amount of 26,452, and, and enterprise funds which are waste and water. Did you have anything to add? No, so this uh, this is the exact same amounts that were on the original ordinance that came before council, but the beginning and ending amounts, there was a clerical error, so we had to bring it back to council. So this is no no other changes other than those amounts. Are you sure? Because I'd love to read it again yeah. next, <laughs> next month. If I could. <laughs> Let, let's hope. <laughs> Given that this is a public hearing, is anyone else on council have any comments? Harry Nudd and from the audience have a comments with regards to ordinance number 2019-19. Seeing none, I declare the public hearing closed. We have a motion for the adoption of ordinance 2019-19. I'll make a motion to adopt ordinance number 2019-19. Thank you. And a second? I'll second. Thank you. A motion was made by Mr. Edwards to adopt ordinance number 2019-19, an ordinance repealing ordinance 2019-14, and adopting new ordinance 2019-19 to adjust the City of Bellbrook appropriations for 2019. So seconded by Mrs. Seeger Lawson. Mr. Edwards. Yes. Mrs. Seeger Lawson. Yes. Mr. Greenwood. Yes. Mrs. Middle Stutter. Yes. Dr. Van Beldhuizen. Yes. Mr. McGill. Yes. Mayor Schwaller. Yes. After having had four public hearings last meeting, uh, October the 14th, tonight only one, we have very little legislation this evening, which is nice. We have no ordinance of, no introductions of ordinances, nor do we have any resolutions, but we do have a city manager report. Let's 
see. Um, Franklin Street Bridge Project. Uh, service director and I met with staff from LJ Beater re to review the first stage of design for the project. Um, it's it's gonna it's gonna look great. Um, it was the first time that we were able to see a uh, more refined uh, design. They had it on a huge screen for us to see. So uh, we are well on track with that project. I think that first uh, stage design wasn't supposed to happen until uh, mid 2020, and we're just trying to get things moving so that if funding does become available um, through. MBRPC from maybe projects getting pushed back or coming in under budget that our project which is smaller and in, um, in the grand scheme of things might get funded sooner so um, final design will be next year and uh, was folded into the budget that we reviewed earlier um, the small business revolution television show that I had talked about before um, everybody that had nominated Bell Brook uh, should have got an email outlining the next steps on November the 18th they will narrow it down to the top 10 towns and then they'll actually be visiting towns to be able to pick one for their show so I know that we had a lot of nominations for Bellbrook which is really great so it'd be really exciting if that happened um, so the farmers market has officially come to the end we did not get to do the one last uh, this past weekend it was horrible weather for it and <coughs> with you know things being at the end of season um, there wasn't really a lot of product with the vendors so um, we're excited to uh, have the first year under our belt and bring it back next year and I've had a community member and a vendor um, of the market actually volunteer to help run that so that'll be good um, the Brook Mills and Be Well Bellbrook event in 2020 uh, staff met with the uh, race director of the actual race and we selected a date for next year we verified this with the Lions Club so that we know that there's no conflict mm -hmm. here um, which it's, it's going to sound like there is, but there's not, I assure you. Um, so August 22nd will be the date of the Brook Mills 10K and the BOL Bellbrook event. So we're really excited to bring that back and hopefully make it even bigger and better than it was uh, this year. Um, and the Lions Club Festival will be the following weekend, um, just so that everybody knows. Um, and I know that there was talk about a uh, Bellbrook Open for Business event, uh, which we were hoping to do an open house style event for any empty spaces downtown. Um, we're going to table that until the spring. We weren't able to get as much response as we'd hoped, so we're going to kind of take a more personal approach with some of the property owners and hopefully get them on board for the spring. So um, we still want to do it, but um, it's just not going to work out in November. So I think that the first date was supposed to be this Saturday. So I sent out a letter to all the property owners letting them know. So we'll kind of regroup and um, try to give us some more lead time into that and do it in April. So that's it for me. Any questions of the city manager's report? Okay. Um, you went to Newark. Did you see the basket? I've seen it before, but I didn't go. I didn't visit it this time. Did they do anything with that? I, last time I seen it was empty. I don't know if they've done anything with it. Yeah. I mean, it's a unique building. It's, it's a neat building, yeah. <laughs> That's all I have. Any other comments of council? Good report, Melissa. <clears throat> Let's move on to committee reports. Service? Uh, nothing tonight. Thank you. Safety? Uh, just a quick note. Um, I get the, it's called on the job criminal justice update from Dave Yost, our attorney general, top cop. And I just read a paragraph. Uh, uh, one of the questions that inevitably arises after a school shooting is when a shooter clearly showed signs of trouble, why wasn't the attack prevented? says prevention is a missing piece after every attack attorney general Dave Yos said and the safety of children across our state depends on us plugging the gap to that end Yost and his team of school safety experts have devised an initiative centered on the prevention of targeted violence it will send funding to both law enforcement officers and schools since the teen gunman killed three students at Chardon High School in 2012 Ohio has started a tip line and worked with schools to create emergency plans. The Attorney General said, those are like bookends on a shelf and what we still need are the books, which give meaning to the space in between. That's why we're asking for law enforcement officers and school officials to team up to help prevent violence. So I think this is positive and uh, uh, I hope he continues on with this uh, process so our most precious uh, don't have to endure some of these things. So. 
I, I was really pleased to hear that they're, they're working hard on this. So. And that's all I have. Thank you. Buddy, it's an audit. Thank you, Mayor. Tonight was our first of three work sessions to discuss the 2020 budget. Um, tonight we discuss administration and uh, other ser in service. Um, we have one for police and we have one for fire at our next consecutive two meetings. Um, be assured that council is looking at each of the budget item lines and doing our very best to make sure that our tax dollars or your tax dollars are spent as, as, as best as possible. Um, it's, it's a good process. We do this every year. We have some good discussion on some of the items and um, you know, we'll have a budget here by the end of the year to pass and present to the community. That's all I have. Very good. Thanks, Nick. Community Affairs. Uh, the only thing is to remind folks that Thursday is beggars night, rain or shine. It's uh, coordinated with all of the surrounding communities so that everybody's on the same night. So Thank you. That, that's it for. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Old business, the matter of the Green County Master Trail Plan Support Request. This was essentially $1,200 and some change. Yes, so this, all of the area municipalities uh, in the county, so villages, townships, cities, um, everybody came together uh, <coughs> to get around some maps and talk about various connections that uh, we would like to see as a wish list in the in our various communities and so uh, Green County Parks and Trails and Green County Regional Planning uh, wanted to do a trails master plan so this is actually going to piggyback off of their uh, land use plan for the county so I know that the question was raised at the last meeting um, what the county was contributing uh, by folding this plan in with their land use plan it, they're going to get a, a better rate on this um, so that's that's part of their contribution whereas also Green County Parks and Trails and Regional Planning our county departments which are funded directly through the county so that was the answer that I received to the question about the county's funding and um, they're asking each municipality uh, each community township uh, $1,250 uh, to go towards the total of 49810 for the master trails uh, planning project so um, I had spoken with Sugar Creek Township and it had not gone before the trustees but um, their administrator felt that that's definitely something that they would support because the trails are important to them as well and I know that uh, we would all like to see a nice connection to Spring Valley we know that that's a very very touchy subject and a very tricky uh, connection to be made but um, connecting us to the greater uh, trail network is really important whether that's the, the connection that makes the most sense or not I don't know but this plan is a step in that direction just to say where we would like to be connected and it's it's a plan that would be adopted um, with the intention of being able to go out and point to the plan to be able to try to get some funding in the future so the ask is for 12 hundred fifty dollars and if council is supportive of that then we could fold that into the 2020 budget any discussion amongst council I just think in support of our safe routes to school that the township is has in place and the intense use of our roads for bicycling um, and walking I, th I think it's Worth the investment because it's it's yeah. hugely popular in our in our entire community. And this is also one of the goals in the comprehensive plan as well. Yes. So it's nice to at least get right. get some direction. I think for twelve fifty, I would think that's something we'd want to do. Yeah, it falls right into the comprehensive plan. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I, I think it's a good thing to to get with because of the management and planning is very important. And that should sum up to make it more safe. I think it's worth the effort. We have a motion for it, Pam. Or? Yes. We have a motion to support the Green County Master Trail Plan request. I will move so. Can we have a second? Second. Can we call the roll? Yes. A motion was made by Mrs. Middlestetter to commit commit the one thousand two hundred and fifty dollar payment as our uh, contribution to the countywide trails master plan this was seconded by mr. McGill mrs. Middlestetter yes mr. McGill yes mr. Edwards yes 
Mr. Greenwood? Yes. Mrs. Seeger Lawson? Yes. Dr. Van Beltheisen? Yes. Mayor Schweller? Yes. This moves us to new business, and tonight's new business is the request to remove the walking path from the approved plans for Section 3, Phase 1 of Highview Terrace. Do we have anybody from the audience who's going to start it, or do you um, want to start the discussion? Or I can start the discussion. Um, okay, so let me make sure I get to the right page here. So there are a number of documents in uh, the council packet. I tried to create a uh, staff report that just kind of summarizes all of this. Um, I know that the property owners are um, here that are making the request, um, so they'll be able to, to speak um, speak about their concerns. So just so that everybody kind of knows what's in front of us, um, as part of the development that has been uh, recorded, when, when a development comes um, such as this, it goes to planning board for approval and then it comes to council for approval. And so in this particular plan, there is a walking path um, that is part of an easement. So there's a utility easement that's approximately 50 feet wide and it basically runs from Dot's parking lot down near the old driveway, um, which I think that the old driveway entrance is still semi-visible. And it goes up, basically um, hugs the property slash tree line along lot 50, and then it cuts up in between lot 50 and uh, lot 51 um, and ties into the cul-de-sac, which is Sugar Maple Place. So the property owners of lots 49 and 50 are concerned um, for a variety of reasons with the walking path that is in the plan and so they are requesting removal of the path from the plan um, just for clarification purposes and this is all in the packet. Um, there are actually two walking path easements that are in the Highview Terrace area. There is a map um, which is page three of the staff report and the original easement path is marked in red and uh, the second easement path uh, which is the one that we're speaking about tonight uh, with the request to be removed is highlighted in yellow. So the original easement was dated 1975 and it's a five foot wide easement that um, it's, it's really hard to locate this. Um, I can you can see it on the plans but to understand what's actually what actually exists um, on the ground is kind of hard to tell because it appears to run right alongside the creek in the tree line um, so that original easement like I said was 1975 and the second easement was uh, filed with the development um, plans in 2017 and it's 50 foot wide um, which is a utility easement and a walking path easement but there, in our, in all of the looking at all of these uh, different maps and plans and things like that, um, there was never really a formal proposal for the path. Meaning, it's a 50-foot easement, but there's nothing that says that they were going to put a 50-foot path in. Um, it's really hard to tell what exactly the path was going to be. I think that it was just thought to go inside that easement somewhere but we do know that the exact location as far as we can tell um, has not fully been specified inside that 50 foot width um, so we have a history that is provided in the packet the final development plan uh, was approved in May of 2016 with an ordinance uh, with uh, conditions regarding the walking path easement. Um, it was supposed to be between lots 51 and 74 and lot 74 ended up becoming lot 50. It got renumbered at some point um, and council approved that. And in that legislation and development plan there was a notation that said that pedestrian access would be owned and maintained by the homeowners association which is printed on the plan. City Council then granted final approval in February of 2017 with a resolution um, which is also attached. So that's kind of Council's action as it's related to that development. 
Um, and then there's some other uh, supplemental information in here uh, describing the two paths that I just outlined, um, ownership and liability, which as far as we can tell um, on the plan, it says that the Homeowners Association is responsible. Um, there have also been some floodplain uh, concerns that were raised. Um, Bill Sheeman is kind of our expert uh, floodplain uh, spokesperson, so to speak, and he did not foresee any <coughs> immediate issues. Granted, um, he's just a, a, a local individual that has a wealth of knowledge. Um, he wasn't a paid engineer or anything like that, for what it's worth. Um, but he does have a lot of knowledge, and if, if there's ever a concern about floodplain, Bill would definitely be our first stop, I would think. So um, So just I just wanted to preface that with uh, that statement. Um, and then it's noted that the comprehensive plan that was just adopted encourages walkability and access to downtown, which was kind of the goal of the path um, to connect some of those northern communities to the downtown area. So this first came to planning board because any change to a recorded record plan has to first be considered by planning board. Now granted, this is just a conceptual idea, there haven't been any revised drawings that were actually provided with any removal of the path or anything like that. So it's a bit of an unconventional request in that regard because normally the requests that come before planning board and then council are actual plans that you look at. Um, so this, this, uh, this Would actual... Would also be the developer bringing those plans forward? Yes, the developer is typically the one that brings those plans forward as well. So, um, so this is a bit unconventional just by way of... Um, by way of the way that this is being presented. Um, so planning board <coughs> first had the request presented at their August 22nd meeting. They ended up tabling it because they wanted to take a closer look at it. And then uh, on September 19th, they met again. They actually went out and they walked it and then had a formal meeting. And they denied uh, with a vote of three to, three to zero to um, make any changes to the record plan. So. Um, the homeowners would like for council to uh, take a look and to uh, weigh in on this um, since planning they were not satisfied with the planning board's decision. So um, there is a wealth of information provided by the property <laughs> owners. Um, I've provided you know some of the legislation that was passed and some other things. So um, and council was also provided with this information on Monday of last week because. It's a lot to look at, and we didn't want to give it to you guys traditionally like we do on Fridays uh, for you to just have the weekend to take a look at it. So um, it's a wealth of information, and I know that the property owners are here, so they'll be able to speak to their concerns and address council. Any comments on council this time? Not yet. I'd certainly this time invite the property owner to come forth if you'd like to, or his representative, or... And again, the request is to eliminate the walking path, correct? Yes, sir. Okay. James, like, how long do I have? How much time? Um, how much time, Pam? I, mean, I, I don't know. On this, because it's a case we're seeing, a reasonable. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Right. <laughs> and please correct me if I was wrong with any of that, because I was getting some of that from Jeff and presenting on okay. his behalf. A little bit. So, okay. So, um, just a few things real quick. Mm -hmm. uh, um, one is that it had to come in front of council. Uh, the planning, we always knew at the planning board that the council was going to have the final say. It's not that we weren't, I mean, we weren't pleased with what the planning committee had to say, but it inevitably would have ended up here anyway. So it's not that we were, oh, you know, we're bringing it to you guys as sort of secondary. Right. So no matter what, even if the planning board had ruled in our favor, it was still had to have come in front of council. Right. Um, you know, so that so that being said, um, one of the things I would like to I guess question is uh, you mentioned Bill uh, is he a certified EPA? Um, you said that he would be our go-to on any sort of flood issues or any sort of flooding that would happen. Um, is he is he a certified engineer? Is he? I don't an know EPA what Mr. Sheeman's uh, credentials are. He's just. He's always been a very vocal member of the community with floodplain issues and works really closely with Hope Taft. So he's a good reference point for us. If he had a concern, he could refer us to somebody okay. that would. But I don't think he's an engineer, to be honest. Yeah, I mean, he's okay. he's somebody that that's really concerned about floodplain yeah. issues in the community. <coughs> did, so we like to. Did talk he come out and walk the property? Um, I'm not sure if he did or not. Is Jeff in the room? 
Did did Mr. Sheeman go out to the property? Uh, not with me. He said he stopped by and, and walked I don't know if he did or not. Uh, so I spoke to him on the phone and he said he would walk down on the street side. Okay, because it's, I mean, if you're not walking, the reason I asked this is this is sort of some new information. Mm -hmm. Okay, and, um, you know, we've, we've walked it. Uh, some of the council has come out and walked it with us. Mm -hmm. Uh, we walked with the planning committee. They, the planning uh, committee wouldn't step outside of the easement we were talking about, so they didn't actually look at the other path mm -hmm. that the city already has since 1974-75. Um, so they would only walk the path that we were talking about that day. So as we were walking, I was trying to explain to them if there's another easement right here, there are other options. Um, they weren't really open to the idea at all. It was only to discuss the, the path that we were, you know, that we're talking about tonight um, and so part of the reason I bring this up is uh, you know if, if we're gonna if we're gonna ask there's there's this is this is serious okay this has lasting consequences for my wife and I we're the property owners okay and um, you know it seems to be that there's a group think with this sort of situation and um, you know I sort of I sort of any, any meeting I go into or anytime I'm, I'm involved in anything like this uh, you know, I, I sit back and think, and, and a quote comes to mind, be wary of the man who urges an action in which he himself incurs no risk. The only people in this room, okay, that incur risk are my wife and I. We're the ones that are carrying this risk for as long as we own the property, for as long as we're Bellbrook residents. And we are serious about being Bellbrook residents. My girls cheer, we play soccer, we play softball, we're in Girl Scouts, you know, we're, we're in the, the, the library, the girls just got an award here the other night. So we plan to be in the community for a long time and we want to be positive members of the community that being said um, we are the only two that are incurring any risk on this whatsoever no one no one sitting up here incurs any risk the developer incurs no risk the people walking the path all they incur risk because it's the elevation and it's dangerous um, at the end of the day I'm the one that has to uh, pick up the pieces and I'm the one that has the to, to carry the insurance and I'm the one that has to deal with it um, the, it has sort of got sidetracked with the whole flooding thing, and, and you know, I apologize, but it sort of threw me for a loop because um, one of the things that stands out, and anyone that's walked the property, uh, the path has been placed right across a drainage basin. And that drainage basin is what keeps all the water from running into Little Sugar Creek. So if you come out and walk the property, you can see there's gullies all the way down Little Sugar Creek, deep ravines that that water comes rushing down. Uh, just at the last, just at the last uh, committee meeting, my wife and I were here, and they're combining lots uh, 51 and 52. And although I believe you stated that there was a drainage easement that uh, wasn't going to be removed, it is. They're building the house right in the middle of that lot. That's going to put all that water. Once they regrade this, okay, all that water is going to come to the front, and it's going to run down the cul-de-sac, and it's going to go over the hill, right where we're talking about putting a walkway, a walk path. The service departments came out and looked at it. The uh, Green County has came out and looked at it. They've dug it up three times this year in the drainage basin. They've cleaned the drainage basin out. Um, the reason I bring this up is the only thing that you can put in there is chips and dust. Uh, the, the, the city, Rick, the developer, uh, they agree that chips and dust is all can go there. Pavement can't go there. It's an easement. It's, it's, a, it's a sewage easement. It's a water easement. Okay. If you pave it, if you put steps on it, and something happens, it's going to get tore up in the city or the, the county. They've already told us they're not responsible for putting it back. Um, we've stated all the facts and we've sort of beat them to death. Um, and, and, and I don't mean to get sidetracked on the EPA issues, but if, if we're just going with a non-expert to come out and walk the property and say, he says it's okay, I have problems with that because it's not okay, all right? If you've walked the property, and Melissa, I don't think we've met out there, I know Jeff has walked it with us, but I don't think we've personally met out the property. If you walk, if you walk from the cul-de-sac over the hill in the sewage and water easement, okay, that's completely washed out. And if you try to go down it right now, it's a slip and slide all the way to the bottom. Um, I walked it yesterday, and I wear big rubber boots that go up to my knees, and I end up in my ankles and mud. That's the reason Green County has come out and dug that basin up three times this year. They had to put an extension on top of the sewage manhole cover, two feet, because there's two feet of mud down there since they originally did it. Okay? And they put a stick in the ground, that way when it covers with two more feet of mud, they know where it's at and they can dig it down again. Um, so if we're, if we're using a non-expert on something that's going to have lasting consequences 
on, on myself, my family, my wife, because we're the ones that are incurring the, um, the, uh, the risk, I take issue with that. Um, James, one comment I'll make, not to interrupt you, but I will. But, uh, you know, we just got we just talked to him kind of, I think it was a casual conversation. Mm -hmm. I don't think we asked him to make an opinion on anything, yes, and I don't think his comments are going to be binding on us. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're going to, if we have engineering work to be done, we will, we will make sure that we get engineers to do that work. I, I, yes, sir. And I, I just want to clarify. It, it's, being, it's being stated in, in the meeting, as a matter of fact. And so that's the reason. Yeah. I, I, so, uh, you know, I would, I would ask the, you know, the council to, uh, to forego his opinion, unless you come out and, and, you know, please look at it yourself. So there's, there's a couple of things that, that, uh, that my wife and I were told when this uh, started. It's going to be a heavy lift. Uh, it's probably not going to happen. Um, you know you're fighting enough to battle. And the reason I bring that up is, uh, you know, we're the ones that, that have skin in the game. And, and anytime, anytime you hear that, all right, so let's think about it. Any, anytime we've heard, oh, it's going to be an uphill battle. It's going to be a heavy lift. It's going to be a heavy fight. You know, the 19th Amendment, is anybody aware of it? It's women's right to vote. Mm -hmm. What if they hadn't listened? I'm sure they were told it's a heavy lift. I'm sure they were told uh, this isn't going to happen. You know, heaven forbid women have the right to vote. You know, and look where we are now. Look at the council. Yes. Ruby Bridges, Brown versus Board of Education, desegregation of schools. Does anybody ever Google those images? Have you seen the people that were against it? James Meredith, the Ole Miss riots. Okay, he was a veteran. He's an Army veteran. Couldn't attend Ole Miss. Do you think that someone didn't tell him it's going to be a heavy lift? You shouldn't do this. Yeah, they did. They did. But he did it anyway. That's the reason I bring this up. I, I, I literally have gotten sick of hearing it's going to be a heavy lift. You guys can't get this done. We have stated the facts, and I'm not going to rehash them. You guys know it's over a sewer. It's over a water. If it gets dug up, it's not getting replaced. If there's a crack, if there's a leak, it's literally a disaster out there. And yet we are hell bent to put a path on it. Hell bent to put a path on it. No matter what, we're putting a path in there. Rick's going to put three thousand dollars worth of chips and dust and walk away. And then you know who's going to be shoveling all that out of the drainage easement? This guy. Because once the plat is built, I'm responsible for it. I'm responsible for the drainage basin where it all ends up, and I'm responsible for the big hole in the ground that this path goes right across. Green County's dug it up three times this year. To rent an excavator is about $400, $500 a day, okay? I'll be down there with a the shovel digging it out every time we have a rain like we did on Saturday. And the reason I bring that up, okay, is no one seems to be taking into account the personal side of this because we're so hell-bent on this path. On this path that only, it only helps the people on Little Sugar Creek. I haven't seen one person from the vineyards or Sable Ridge in here. I haven't. Why? Because they walk down the path that we have to do. We have to fix Little Sugar Creek Road. The vineyards in Sable Ridge walk down the guardrail on Little Sugar Creek Road. They do. They don't come up through High View. They never come up through High View. And even if you force this path that we have to maintain, they're still not going to come up through High View. They're not. They're not going to walk up and around. They're going to make a right on Little Sugar Creek, go across the guardrail, by McGee Park, and they're going to walk right down the right right down the guardrail where we have to fix it anyway. So I'm just asking for a little common sense, and and, and not be so hell bent on we we have to have this path. We have to have this path. A little less group thing. I'm not saying you guys. You know, my, you, you you you've seen it. My wife and I in the planning commission. We were the only two here. Okay, the whole room full of people. Some of them don't even live in Bellbrook. Um, you know, some of them, some of the letters that were included in the original package to the planning board have Beaver Creek, Beaver Creek addresses. They don't even have houses in, in Highview right now. Is it, so this, this whole thing's been a little frustrating to us. It's because we've gotten up and we, we've said the facts, we've said the truth, and it just seems to be hell bent to leather. We want the path, we want the path, we want the path no matter what. So I, I just ask that you, uh, that, you, that you set back, please take a good hard look at it. The facts are there. In your hearts, if you've looked at the facts and you know that it's in a floodplain, you know that it's going to wash out, you know it's going to end up in the creek, you already know the right decision. Okay, just because it's in the, in the, in the comprehensive plan doesn't mean it's gospel. It doesn't mean it's the Constitution. It doesn't mean it has to be done. We can change it. We can change it. So I'm going to end with this. What is truth? Does anybody know who said that? Pontius Pilate. 
what is truth? When Jesus was on trial, Pontius Pilate said, what is truth? Because the crowd was screaming, kill him, kill him, crucify him. And Pontius Pilate knew he was innocent. He knew he was innocent. He knew the facts. He knew Jesus hadn't done anything. He knew it. But he washed his hands and let him be crucified. So I end with what is truth. Thank you, James. You know, this is something we have not had before. We're kind of walking on uh, new territory. What I'd like to see done ideally is to have the citizens in high view work with the developer and come forward with a new final plan revision that would accommodate it, every, take into account everyone's best interests. I guess it's the best way to resolve it because I think we're getting put in a spot that we don't really have any skin in the game, as you said. We're going to get complaints from one side for not having the path and the other side for having the path. And I walked the path with James on Thursday. And I want city staff to go back in and look to see about the elevation and the grade. I am surprised that we ever approved a plan that is that steep. Mm -hmm. And then we got the drainage manhole covers down at the bottom, which once we get a heavy rain, those are going to probably lift and become open holes. And it's going to be a worse mess. Mm -hmm. And already we're having the county to go out there and have to dig these manhole covers out. And they literally put a two by four in so they can find out where it is right now. So they don't have to look so hard to find the manhole covers. And if we put chips in that pathway, every time it rains, those chips are going to run down just as he described. <coughs> They're going to clog the, the sewer pipe down to the drain pipe. Mm -hmm. And until someone goes out to shovel those things off, we're going to have the entire system all messed up. We're going to have standing water down the property. The path won't be usable by anybody. Mm -hmm. But I think overall, the, the grade is way too steep for a walking path. And I don't know what had happened between the final plan that they presented to us and today, but I think it's incredibly steep. And to your point about, you know, you want what the liability, it is a liability. We walked down there very carefully. Now, I'm not very fit, but you are. <laughs> but we took our time walking down that path, and it was very difficult to walk down there. And I would not think anybody would want to have their children walking down. Right. I also don't think most adults would be happy walking down there. Right. And I, you know, I, I can only imagine the rain on, on Saturday, what that did to it. But there were some big, deep ravines in this path. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, Melissa, who's the person to do it if we have our engineer to go back and get in touch with the developer engineer. But I, I think the elevation has changed from what was initially approved. I, mm -hmm. I don't think we would have approved. And again, I'm not an engineer, but I don't think we'd approve anything that steep, period. <coughs> Council? I have seen lots and lots of dirt being pushed around on that development in the last couple of years, and I totally yep. agree yeah. that it's different than what we approved. Just, I mean, I, I don't read elevation plans very well at all, but I watched that dirt being shoved around and houses being built on dirt that was just recently put in place. So. It's, it, and it was washing down into Little Sugar Creek the entire time that development's being built because there's nothing growing on it. It's right. just dirt. Right, right. I, I think that um, taking away the path is probably not a good idea because people are going to walk there anyway. And so they may not be walking where we're, we put this path, but they're going to walk somewhere. So I feel like we need to put a path where it makes sense for the, for the people in the area, the homeowners and the property owners. Um, I also think that if you don't give them a designated path, they're going to walk where they want to walk. And then they might be walking through your side yard. They might be walking around your porch or something like that. Well, so that's what they're doing now. Right. Mm -hmm. so, so I think that we need to work with the developer and the engineers to, to make something that, that makes sense. I would agree. I think there needs to be a path. Uh, the grade, I was out there today, and I've been out there before. Um, I'm not sure that we have other, we have other grades that are severe. Hill rise try to walk up that I mean that's a pretty severe but grade. it's paved that that would be the, the million dollar question is a soft surface appropriate for this sort of use I'm not sure that it is um, I'm not sure that there's anything in any of the approvals that talked about what it needed to be where it needed to be soft where there need to be concrete asphalt or whatever but I agree with Mr. Schweller that we probably need to get the developer and the association, whoever, together to figure out a viable way to make this path work. Because I, I, I remember the approval of High View when I was on planning board, and that was when it was along the river, and there was issues with that because that, you know, the whole thing was in the flood. Um, I don't wasn't involved in the the recent adjustment to the plan, but um, there's got to be a way to make it work. And if there isn't a way to make it work, then Let's see the engineering 
that tells us that there's no way to make it work. Mm -hmm. I mean, we just need to get all the facts. And we, you're right to your point, we can't force something just because it's in a plan. But I don't have enough information right now to say, no, let's scrap this. I'd like to see someone say, or an engineer report saying, this grade is too steep, the drainage isn't appropriate, we cannot put hard surface on there, soft will just wash away. That'll make our decision easier, I mm -hmm. think. I agree, I agree. I recall on planning when it was originally, because I was on planning board when it was originally approved as well, and it was to be along Little Sugar Creek. And it was not going to be paved, it was just going to be a soft path and kind of kept open so people could walk there. They, People walking there keep it open now anyway. But um, I didn't go back and look, but I did not recall any paths internal to the development itself and people are not going to walk up from Little Sugar Creek and walk up that big steep hill and then walk down from inside they're going to go along Little Sugar Creek like they're doing right now. Mm -hmm. so I'm going to walk right in the heart of about 50 or 49 where it's a little bit more casual grade. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but yeah. I walked uh, <clears throat> with Mr. Cyphers uh, last Thursday afternoon and I've been watching this plat as it's been in, mm -hmm. been going in. It's and like Elaine pointed out, a lot of dirt moved around um, in that particular area. I live in the floodplain, so I'm always interested in the floodplain and things that affect it. And um, I was kind of questioned the, a retention pond in the floodplain. I don't understand that concept. Um, the drainage all from the point where from the sidewalk down, as if so stated, is steep. And all that runoff goes into a fairly small pipe that runs, I'm, I'm guessing, 30, 40 yards into the retention pond. So all that debris uh, stops it up uh, several times. Mm -hmm. It's had to be cleaned out. Um, also, Mr. Cyphers took me on the original path next to the Little Sugar Creek. And I think in some way, it'd be a missed opportunity not to incorporate that some way. It's a beautiful down there. And, uh, I know uh, McGee Park has uh, next to the creek. They cleaned that out since I've lived here, and people go to the park, and the first thing you do is you go out to the creek because their body of water is always interesting. And so, the association and the developer, I think, if they would take a second look at this and and look at all the different options available and a nice piece of real estate in the creek that you have, I think it'd come out a lot better than what we've got thrown at us here and like Mayor Schweller stated that you know we hate to be thrown in to tell you or approve something that maybe um, you know we just don't like to tell people what to do but it is our job to approve this but I think a second look would definitely be I mean there's no big hurry I don't think there's a big hurry in doing it and uh, so with the uh, sewer easements and all the easements I think it may be a, I'm guessing maybe it looked at well it's an easy place to put a path there's already an easement there so and it <clears throat> the other question I never really got a good answer on and I never talked to an attorney or anything but the liability factor Mr. Cyrus brought up as far as if somebody falls on the path since it's on his lot I don't know if, if he is liable and uh, I don't know there's uh I believe the paperwork said that the HOA is is liable because it's owned by. It doesn't by really say they are. It says they would maintain, but doesn't really address the liability issue. Okay. There's a, sim there, there's a similar easement walkway between Sugar Run and Regent Park. Right. That's hard service. It's concrete. You know, I'm sure the liability issue can be resolved itself. I can't imagine the property owners on either side are going to be liable I mean they could yeah. be but well, I'm just saying yeah. an answer, yeah. I, I guess the other question I have we don't the city doesn't have any enforcement mechanism to determine what type of surface goes on that path correct I think the county said they couldn't put a hard surface on it well, it, it was is discussed in council and it was part of um, one of the discussions I can't remember if the full I thought I saw that in specifications but at one of the council meetings I think it was the first one uh, the conversation was had about what it was going to be and I think that they talked about gravel and then they talked about asphalt um, so it it was part of the approvals 
but now I can't remember exactly where it was. It might be in here. But it was part of the council discussion. Did we stipulate one of specifically them. what it was to be? I thought, just... I thought so. I thought it said something. I thought like, it was supposed to be. matter, blah, blah, blah. It said something like not, I don't know what it said. I mean, there's a big difference between soft and hard as far as costs go. Mm -hmm. And Yeah. And, and, but again, if we don't have any enforcement ability to say what it has to be, then that's going to be a negotiation between the residents, their association, and the developer to determine, you know, what that may or may shouldn't be. And then look at a larger issue, if we get engineering studies that says it doesn't really matter what it is, you know, if it's concrete or asphalt, if it's still going to wash away at some point, you know, mm -hmm. does it make any sense to, to, to put that in? I mean, yeah. I, I mm -hmm. guess that's, I, I don't know. I mean, I'd like it in, but not just so it could wash away after the first rain. Yeah, storm. soft surface is going to wash away if that, if I mean, that soft, slope. Yeah. I think I saw it in minutes, and I think it was um, May of 2016 when it was discussed. But I think it was in minutes. I know I've read it. Mm -hmm. there, I mean, there's a lot of information about Hy-Vee Terrace that's been out there. So, I mean, we've, we've looked at a lot of different things. So, I mm -hmm. guess at the end of the day, if, if um, additional studies are done or we get additional opinions, we're going to have to decide whether or not we're going to enforce that trail easement, correct? Okay, and what, we're, what I'm saying, I, know, I can't speak for everyone else, is that we don't have enough information to make that determination tonight. Mm -hmm. That there is... No. And that we would like to get more information to see if it's possible. Once it's, if we find out that it's possible, then at that point we can start talking about what the surface needs to be and how it needs to go. And I think it's important walkability. Home, ho homes within a walkable distance from downtown are very, you know, it's very important and it's you know desirable by a lot of communities. We have it. We just need to try to make it work if we can, and not at anyone's cost or expense or liability. I understand Mr. Cypher's point. Yeah. And I'm concerned too, we do a hard surface with that slope right now, that's going to have a lot of water rushing down mm -hmm. that hill and it's going to be a mess at the bottom, even worse than it is right now. Once so. the <laughs> grading is done, if um, something like a, a prairie grass or something of that nature that has really deep roots that specifically absorbs a lot of moisture and prevents erosion can stop a lot of the erosion, but that can't be done until all of the pushing is. Yeah. The dirt around is done, and it's it's continually washing down the street or down the hill. I mean, it buried the the uh, what do you call those plastic fences that are supposed to sub silt fences. Silt yeah. fences. Yeah. It just pushed right over it and buried mm -hmm. them. So um, yeah, it's that steep. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it is. I really think that we should go back to city staff and have the engineer that we used go back and meet with the developer. And make sure the grade is, in fact, what was approved on the, the final plan submitted. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. And then, to the extent that that is the same grade, which would surprise me because it's overly steep, I think, mm -hmm. then find out what plan B is and have mm -hmm. them work to try to bring something forward to the council. Yeah. I think that's a good idea. No, I, I, I would agree with your comments, Mayor. Um, I, I have been out there. I've walked it once. I have not walked it with the yeah. ciphers, though, at this point. Um, I, I think it is too steep. I think the elevation has is different at this point. I also think that, um, you know, as a homeowner, um, I, I get a little emotional with, with this case because I, I have also experienced a, a situation like this where you've had an easement through your backyard and you have people walking back through and your house is there and you can't enjoy the activity of that, that home. So I, so I appreciate what you, what you had to say there with respect to that. But still, I don't think we have enough information right in front of us right now determine whether or not we take that easement out of there or we leave it in modified to some degree to whatever d development plans would would uh, allow based on the developer you and the homeowners association the utility easement is there it's yeah. that's a done deal but the walking yeah. path easement is a mm -hmm. separate issue mm -hmm. i i didn't walk it i went out with catherine one day and looked at it and i said yeah i'm not walking down there <laughs> <laughs> so it, it's super steep yes. so. Dr. Dave? Well, there's a guy who lives on Hill Rise and does walk that hill. <laughs> uh, I walked, on a sidewalk. I walked your path one day, came up, and it does seem steep. Um, I think that, um, as, as you all say, things might have changed since, um, since it was originally done. 
Um, I, I wonder, I mean, if, if I might, when, when did you purchase the lot and build the home? Was that, was that after, um, was that after the 2016, the 2017 plan? Yes, sir, it was. Uh, so we purchased the lot, uh, and I remember the conversation. I was uh, in the cul-de-sac speaking with Nate, you know, his Rick's son, and we were talking about purchasing a lot. And um, he said, you know, we're going to put a walk path in for the, for the Highview, uh, mm -hmm. Highview residents. And uh, what started us in learning about the comprehensive plan and everything else was, and as you guys are well aware, I'm not going to rehash it, but uh, all the traffic that we were getting coming through, uh, not on the pathway, but you know, through the yard and the driveway and the, the, the back porch. Um, and that is what started us, or my wife, uh, looking into it. And then we realized, well, this, was, this wasn't just a, you know, the resident pathway, that it was part of the comprehensive plan. And then now we're learning that it could possibly be part of the Greene County plan, um, you know, which sort of expands on things a little bit. Because then when you start looking into it, it's, well, it's a path, it's a walkway easement, but it's listed in the comprehensive plan as a multi-use path, and it's not. It's a walkway easement mm -hmm. uh, because it's connected on, you know, with the sidewalk at the top, and then it'll connect. It'll go into the commercial property of dots on the back end. Um, and, you know, I'm sure kids aren't going to get off their bike and say, "Wait a minute, this is where the walk path starts," and walk their bike over the hill. Um, so anyway, that we were aware it was going to be for residents, high view residents, um, but then it sort of got a lot bigger on us really pretty quick um, and then that's you know we learned that it's a sewer easement and it's a water easement and then Green County came out and dug the whole thing up and we were like you know what's going on here and so you know it's not necessarily the fact that uh, you know we're, we're trying to seclude ourselves on our own little piece of heaven that's not it we're simply trying to say this isn't a good place for a path this is it's unsafe and it's not you know out of, out of all Bellbrook out of Highview Terrace, I'm sure we could come up with a more viable option for a path for the residents, you know, to connect to McGee Park, to connect, you know, to, to connect Highview instead of taking them over that hill right there. And then and, and that's all, you know, when, when we realize, okay, wait a minute, you know, this could be some kid that's not connected to the, to the, to the neighborhood, you know, and it, it sort of changes the liability issues. You know, we weren't really worried about, you know, Todd and Lindsay or our next door neighbors, if their kid gets hurt on the path, the chances of them suing us were a little bit less. Uh, you know, when it expanded quite a bit, then we got a little more concerned about, you know, the kid from five neighborhoods away who thinks, you know, everybody lives there is rich. You know, let's sue the guys down at the end of the street. That's when it, we got a little bit more concerned over that. Mm -hmm. So, I know it's a long-winded answer, but that's sort of it. The, mm -hmm. the history of it. Yeah. So. I think in practical terms, the only people that are going to really use the pathway are the residents they're not going to walk up from little sugar creek the only other ones might be come through from behind but i i still don't see people walking into highview terrace to then walk down into bellbrook uh, you no know, it's an easy path and i think you've seen people doing that so walking up from little sugar creek at the, at the mcgee park end yeah he said people walking both ways they thought his driveway was a sidewalk one time but, okay, I, I just assumed that it would probably be mostly Highview Terrace people, mm -hmm. neighborhood people walking into town. But I know we've got people here that want to talk about it probably, and we do get open discussion next on the agenda, but at this time, if I get the council's approval, we'd certainly let those who want to speak on this issue speak now, mm -hmm. and then we can go into our open discussion. Okay. Any complaints? I don't have a problem with that. You know, we have somebody track time. I don't know who's got a cell phone that can track it, but everyone gets five or three minutes mm -hmm. and say, say mm -hmm. your, your name and address. We ask that you do it to the left room so the view United Sedum can, can see you and hear you. Anybody council object to me doing that? Mm -hmm. Okay, so anybody wants to speak with regards to this matter, we'll consider it the start of open discussion and you get three minutes. Faces up there from the last time I was here. Yeah. Okay. Bill Dowling, 1839 Sugar Maple Place. And I'm here basically on behalf of this complaint about 
the steepness of it and the practicality of it. And actually, when I came here, I intended to ask more questions, and I had more questions. Some of them have been answered. But one of the big questions I have is, does the city actually have a, an easement on that piece of property? Does the city have a recorded easement on that piece of property we're talking about that we want to put this, that you all want to put, or have in the past approved the, is there a recorded easement on that? Like there is an easement for utility. Is there an easement that you own on that? I don't believe so. I think so. it's the HOA that has the HOA. It's for not, it, not the, the city. city. <coughs> it's HOA. It's not city owned. No, I understand that for sure. But so you mean the easement is not city owned? Right. Okay. So the easement is for utilities. Right. Right. So it seems like this is pirating an easement it's for something else that's one question I had and I asked Rick tonight Rick coming or yeah, yeah, Clemens. Clemens about it and he said that he didn't think there was an easement directly just what you have said here tonight and what threw me and the reason it caused me to ask that question is I was kind of horrified is this a is this a sidewalk that we're going to put in or is this a path we're going to put in if we have to put something if you choose to make us do this to vote in that way is this a sidewalk or a path or does it make any difference you know I would think it's a path to be honest with you because I'm, I'd be concerned about how steep it is for the blessed walk that's what it says thing. on the plants it's a walking path not yeah. a sidewalk there were never specifications for material or thickness or anything submitted with the plan it's just put in as a walking path and like I said it's a 50 foot easement but there was no specifications in terms of it's going to be a 10-foot path or it's going to be a 50-foot path. There were never any specifications regarding the actual path. Well, that's confirmed when I talked to Rick tonight, but he thinks it's just crushed gravel. So much crushed gravel in there, and that might be what it is, might be what he think it is, it might be right or not. By the way, answer to your question, you said Highview Terrace major changes you thought it was in uh, May. <clears throat> the pedestrian access is to be owned and maintained by the homeowners association. Mm -hmm. So Elaine, okay. you were correct. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's we own it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a, that's what I saw on the plan. And that gives me a little bit of different take on one thing you said here. <clears throat> you, I don't deny that you have a lot of liability associated with it. It's clear and evident, and I and I think that's true. But I'd like to add to that. It seems to me that this proposal is somewhat of a quasi-public-private partnership. And the point of that is that as a partnership, there should be advantages to both sides. Now, the city would like to see this opened up so that people could come from Highview Terrace, they could come from other areas, they could walk up and down, this would be available to the city. Hence, it's actually called in some of your paperwork as a public access. Now, go run out of time here, so just kind of. Yeah, I will, and I might ask to come back again because I didn't get my questions all answered. I haven't even gotten to the statement. The statement is this, though, partially. If it's a public process and it's a combination, then the the homeowners association incur a huge amount of expense too, because it has to be maintained, it has to be, mm -hmm. it has right. to be cleaned, and if it's not. And, it, and where I got horrified was the ordinance that you passed, I think you passed it, 1917, and this is the sidewalks, mm -hmm. okay? Now on the sidewalks it says, it says applies, this policy that you passed applies to all install, to, to all sidewalks and paths installed by owners, developers, homeowners association, condominiums, respective successors and the signs. Now this policy does not, the sidewalk policy does not apply to situations in which the sidewalks or paths have been installed by the city council unless otherwise okay. indicated we're, we're, by a We're not time agreement. right now, so I'm going to have to ask you to adhere to our rules about the three minutes thing. I appreciate your comments. And if you have questions to be asked or to be uh, responded to, please submit them to the city mm -hmm. and we'll deal with them. Yeah. Uh, Thank you. That's not the way it worked last time. Anyone else care to speak? What up? Questions. 
Tim Tuttle, uh, 1791 Sugar Maple Place. Uh, my, I wasn't planning on talking about this issue tonight. I was obviously here for another reason. Um, but I guess my, the main thing I would like to say is that when we moved in, we were under the impression there would be some access to downtown. How you get there, Little Sugar Creek Road, which I know is a mess and has no room for a sidewalk clearly. I just know when we bought in that neighborhood, that was part of the reason we bought there. It's in the city, you're close to downtown, mm -hmm. there should be some way to get from one to the other without putting yourself in danger of walking through something that isn't safe to walk through. Um, so I guess from our perspective, I mean I have children who would love to be able to get to Dairy Shed in the summertime or if I need eggs I'd love to send my oldest down there to get them so I don't have to. Um, that is kind of what we thought when we bought there. That was the reason we built there. Um, and I can attest, even when we built, which was four and a half, five years ago, that that grade was not like that then. It has been changed in the last two and a half years mm -hmm. from probably what was approved. The piece we're talking about right now? Yes. yes. Down there, because the, the cul-de-sac didn't even exist. I mean, at that time, the road to go up the upper section was in a different location completely. And all that changed, and the elevations back there all changed. I mean, again, there was no structures back there at all. So when they started building farther down the street, they changed all that grading. Mm -hmm. So I, I can attest to that at least, because it's been yeah. that. That has changed just in the time we've lived there. So I guess, but how you do it safely, how you do it, I, I tend to agree, though. I don't think the HOA should be reliable or responsible if you want it to be something connecting the downtown to our neighborhood. I think, you know, why, why should the HOA take that responsibility? I, I tend to agree with that. I also agree with the safety issue. I wouldn't, I wouldn't want that running beside my house if I'm in any way liable for it. Um, but I do think it would be mostly for Highview Terrace residents. I, I tend to agree. Maybe Sable Ridge might cross over and come down, but I think it's mostly going to be high view. I think, especially if at some point you connect McGee to downtown, I think the vineyards would use that access point, probably Sable, to be honest, would too, because going up our big hill and then to go back down, it wouldn't be the ideal mm -hmm. walking mm -hmm. path. Mm -hmm. um, but again, I guess the only thing I'd like to express is that I, I, I would love, I know my family would love to have a way to get to downtown. How you can work that? be it through an easement, be it through some other medium. Again, I, I wouldn't begin to say I have a solution for that. I haven't seen enough documentation. Like I said, I wasn't planning on speaking on this, but as a resident there, I, I feel I should at least express my views. Um, okay, yeah, absolutely. But thank you very much. Thank you. If anybody else wants to speak on this topic or any other item, I mean, we can move the entire uh, open discussion forward to have council speak at the end. Okay. And I just wanted to point out that that 50-foot easement was not intended to be a walk path. It's there for a landscape buffer. That's why it's 50-foot. So realistically speaking, it's not an entire walk path where folks can go wherever they want. If you put the walk path on the other side of the landscape buffer, then we no longer have a landscape buffer, which I believe is part of the land, is part of the subdivision regulations. So. I think we need to take that into consideration. The other thing that I wanted to point out is that although the 2016, it was approved to be, it was directed to be owned and maintained by the HOA, it's not owned by the HOA. They didn't buy it, it's not in common space, it's our property. So if the HOA wants to buy it, own it, and maintain it, then that's a whole different ballgame. That's all I wanted to point out. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Sandy Dolling, 1839 Sugar Maple Place. I have been the designated um, HOA collector of fees. I, I'm not, there is no board, there is no HOA association that has any board members. Um, we have a developer, Rick Clemens, he is in charge of everything. He, he says what gets done, what gets paid, what the HOA association, um, what the dues go to for. So you know, for, so basically, right now, all of the dues that we collect each year go to maintaining the entrance, 
maintaining the landscaping, maintaining the common areas, and also the new section, when it was, when it, when it was developed, we're going to have to maintain that back section that's going to be connected to Inverness. Okay, that's what we have to, that's what we're, that's all we're, that's all we have right now. So we don't, the HOA doesn't own anything because we really don't have, you know, a, um, a true HOA association, period. So until he turns it over to us, right. we don't mm -hmm. have a say. Mm -hmm. We're just, pay, I'm paying the, the water bill, you know, you know, the utilities, the maintenance, and the monies that we collect now. When we first, I know um, Elaine was here, and I, I believe you were here, Mr. Sweller, yep. and somebody, maybe um, was here. you were here. When, we very, when this very first came together, there were 12 homeowners up there. Now we've added 22, so we have 34 homeowners. And those 22 new homeowners have no idea about what this path was supposed to be. So we would go down the old path, you know, we would go down carrying our grandchildren in, in, our, in the strollers because you couldn't get down. And the Hofackers, who I don't believe aren't here tonight, they allowed us to go there, down their, their driveway and have access to dots. So what we wanted and what we wanted to do with this new development um, the new, I'm sorry, the new section of the development is just have some easy access way to downtown because we all loved it. And for us, it was supposed to be something more natural, you know, you know an easier way to get down, mulch, something that was just not, you know, industrial. And so speaking to Rick tonight, he said that it was, from what he understood, it was supposed to be aggregate, you know, some kind of stone. But he agreed that that would all wash out as well. So as the grade is now, we now can't walk. We used to walk, you know, our dog and go up and walk up to the office every day. My husband and I, he would walk up to the office and come back. We can't do that now. So I think there's been a little bit of a misconception since, um, you know, this whole pathway, you know, got instituted. And so um, some people have even said, the newer homeowner says, well, you know, I want to be able to have my kids ride their skateboards down there. We want to have the four-wheel drive vehicles go down that path. <laughs> you know, one lady even said that I am going to take my golf cart, down, my golf cart down that. So that was not. I don't think it was our intention. I don't think it was your intention. We just wanted to keep the integrity of the space because it's beautiful. And it goes, you know, if it goes like right down Little Sugar Creek, you know, that would be great. And then one other thing I want to bring up is that I was I had knee surgery. Um, earlier and I was in the hospital and it was in the Dayton Daily News about the city council meeting that they that had approved um, the, the new um, comprehensive plan. Well they were looking at the comprehensive plan and in that it said that the final phase was going to be a sidewalk all the way in that corridor from Franklin to the vineyards um, as a walking sidewalk. So end of story. That's, that's all we need. That would be that would give everybody access to this this whole comprehensive green is it mm -hmm. the Green County Comprehensive Plan. Mm -hmm. So anyhow, that and, and yeah, and I also this is I, I wrote this and then I'd like to submit it so yeah, for the council you. members members sure. to see it because we were kind of like on it from the beginning. Okay, thanks. Appreciate it. Does anyone else in the audience care to speak to this or speak to any other matter before the council? <coughs> Young man in the back row, please. That's fine. Come on. You have to come up, JV. Right. I'm Louis Schatzberg. I live at 4082 Ridgetop Drive. I was on the planning board when this case came up. I believe going down to Dots Market was supposed to be a walking path, and I know there were several walking paths put in around this property in lieu of green space so when we talk about the walking paths we need to remember the green space that each development is supposed to have within it and yeah. this was supposed to have some walking paths in it i don't remember the great detail of them but i remember that was one of the things that they needed to approve was the walking paths that's what i remember as well because i was on the right. planning board with you mm -hmm. um and i want to say it was we approved the plan and in lieu of taxes he was going to donate the green space and the green space was supposed to be for walking, a walking right. path. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. you know, I don't know 
how we ended up with the plan that we have now with a walking path that doesn't seem to work based on the elevation, mm -hmm. but it, it was the developer's responsibility to put in the walking path in lieu of taxes. Right. And that's what they, it w but I don't remember ever discussing what the walking path was going to be made of because I think at that time they didn't know exactly where it was going to be, but they knew it was going to be on the edge of the property somewhere. Mm -hmm. I think it's significant to Mr. Tuttle's point to find out when the elevation changed. Because mm -hmm. if we approved a walking path on a different elevation, then mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. we need to get the elevation back to where it was so right. the path can go in. I think that's key. Mm -hmm. Yeah, correct. All right, thank you. And if 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 I may, Mayor, I mean yeah. in, in line with what he's saying, it, obviously some things have changed. But um, after Louis, some of my time on the board, I thought that when Highview Terrace went in there was supposed to be a path okay I mean that that was part of part of the approval there was supposed to be a path so maybe it changed but where's where's the developer I mean you know as many lots as we've gone back in there and changed for them um, if they're supposed to be a path that's what was originally approved um, and I think that that well predated any plan, any comprehensive plan we had. Mm -hmm. You talk in 2016, 2017, we did the plan last year. And I guess the only other thing as far as, uh, I mean, I, I appreciate your passion, um, but having served with the guys on uh, plan and board, I don't see much group think. Um, I see, you know, three, four other guys with um, very independent opinions. Sometimes we agreed, sometimes we didn't. Um, and I, I guess I don't know anybody's hell bent for leather to put that path in, um, but I, I would say if the developer came in originally and said there would be a path and people expect it and people know it, then sure. there ought to be a path somewhere and um, have, have him uh, be part of that. Mm -hmm. Good, thanks. We got two people to speak. James, you're on the same topic. I'll give you three minutes and then. 2017, I used to sit there and eat my lunch while I was watching them dig out the retention pond because uh, they were building our, our, our pad. And so they took a lot of that dirt uh, in 2017 and moved it around up on the hill. Uh, and then we actually had to do it ourselves when we bought lot 50 was a cliff and then we had to grade that ourselves because mm -hmm. um, it was literally a, probably a 20, 30 foot drop off on the backside of, of that after they had finished building our pad and taking the dirt from the retention pond. So. Uh, and then to your point, I don't want to get them back and forth, but uh, the group think was the entire group of people from the neighborhood, not the planning commission. So that was, you know, to, to, you. to your point. So okay, thank you, Mayor. One other one other item. Can can we find out fairly easily what the liability issue is on that? I guess I, I I'm not. I need to know myself who who's the ownership. It sounds like it's the association. The path in front of Green Meadow Ranch is the association that owns it. So who owns it, who's going to own it, mm -hmm. and what's the liability of the homeowners around it? Okay. You know, I don't question. know how we can find out. If, that if, might help if, at least. If I'm not mistaken, when a sidewalk goes across the front of your property, now the sidewalk and the pathways are different, but when a sidewalk is across your property, even though it's on an easement, it's a public sidewalk, but you're still liable if somebody falls, they can sue you for it not being in proper uh, repair or if they slip and fall on the ice. I believe that the homeowner insurance is, is the one that comes into play. But the, you but can verify that with our attorney, but I'm pretty sure that's what I've always understood as, as a homeowner, that even though that's not really my sidewalk, because it's on my property, I'm liable for it. We can certainly refer that question to council. Mm -hmm. We'll find out what the answer is. Sure, we'll follow up on that. Does anybody else want to come before the uh, council and speak with regards to the item of new business, the walking path, Highview mm -hmm. Terrace? Sorry, I thought somebody would say this. I didn't want to mention it. But um, there was questions about what was supposed to be put down. So 9 May 2016 is when the council approved chips and dust. It went back and forth between should it be paved, should it not be paved. The final decision was chips and dust for a variety of reasons. One was the increased runoff, one was the floodplain issue. And then it's been mentioned again in other meetings. So March 12th, I watched the video the other day. March 12th of 2018, the city manager specifically said it can't be paved due to the floodplain. Okay, thank you. 
Dale Wilson. <laughs> Welcome back. <laughs> um, Dale Wilson, 4098 Maxwell Drive. Um, I do have some history about some of what's going on here. And uh, when this, I've walked that path many times with the uh, with Mark Slugger. And this new easement in 2017 was not there. I mean, the path was, was the red line that you had indicated here. Mm -hmm. And our only concern back then was how to cross the creek to get people into McGee Park. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It was never intended to go up to Highview Terrace. Now, we did talk to Rick Clemens several times saying, how is this? Cause it, and, the, and the impression was then to us that the service department was going to maintain that path, not property owners. Mm -hmm. So our question to Rick Clemens at that time was, where is gonna, where's there going to be access for the service department to get in there? I mean, to, to put this access here, that was never part of the conversation back then. Now, the city did make Rick Clemens put water line in there. So that's why you have a water easement there. We put a water line in there to connect to the water system so we had a loop in the system. Yeah. So, but I don't know how the word walking got part of that easement because it's really supposed to be the red line. That's what the original, you yeah. were exactly right what you said. Absolutely, right. and it was part of the green space that was going to be deeded to the city That's once correct. the development, he couldn't deed it until it was, the That's development was totally done. That is correct. Which is, it's if, still. Then it would become the city's responsibility to maintain it after that part, but that was not what you yes. see in yellow here. No, it, it was, was the red line. 50 foot it was the red line. Correct, and, it, and we always talked like it would be aggregate. Because we talked about that because if we tried to maintain it, you tried to salt it, it would destroy sure. that and things like that. Yeah. But we knew it was going to be aggregate. It would be okay. easier to maintain that than it would be malt or something like that. Yeah. So, and, I mean, I, that's what I recall. I mean, I haven't been part of this process in a year and a half now, but uh, mm -hmm. it was very familiar. To so I just thought I'd offer that yeah. information. You're thank, thank you, Dale. Correct. Thank you. Anybody else? Now, does anyone talk about anything else in open discussion? We'll go to the audience first, and we'll finish up, and we'll conclude with council. So speak now or forever hold your peace. I will never hold. <laughs> David Buckalo, 126 Lower Hillside Drive. <clears throat> I want to talk about the dark building. I'm going to ask the council tonight to delay the dark case. It's, it's before your BZA and Property Review Commission. Mr. Dark's not here. It's probably working. It's creating a hardship on the property owner. I believe there are questionable actions that have been taken by city staff. I do not say that lightly. I say that in utmost seriousness. And I think Mr. Dark's been treated in a very unprofessional manner by city staff. And I'm not going, I don't want to go into the detail here. I don't want to be inflammatory, but I do have detail and um, I have good reason for making those statements. His zoning violations for 27, his fines for $6,700, and the proposed upgrades, according to Mr. Dart, would run over $100,000. That would sink most businesses in Belbrook. I don't know of any businesses in I really don't know of any other than maybe the funeral home that could absorb such a, um, a, a, you know, a financial cost. And I don't understand why there are fines associated with zoning violations. You ought to look at repealing that. Some of the items on his list are petty, some aren't, and the additional time, since there's no damage to the community by waiting, would give Mr. Dart time to work things out in a more reasonable manner. Most business owners find dealing with government at any level, including city government, to be overwhelming. On one hand, the city says we're communicating with Mr. Dart, and I've talked to the, uh, Pamela about that, and I understand that. But on the other hand, Mr. Dart says there is no communication. So obviously, there's a there's a there's no common ground there. I believe there needs to be a balance between the administrative and the legislative branches of this government within the confines of the city charter. And I think that's gotten a little out of whack. 
I fear that too much power has been placed in the hands of the administration, that they're not only setting the tone and the direction of the community, but also responsible for the day-to-day -day affairs of it. So I guess I'm asking, keep within your three minutes, that I'm asking that you look into the performance of the administrative staff with regard to this particular issue, that you delay the DART, uh, pull it off the BCA agenda. As I said, there's going to be no damage done to the city as a result of giving it a delay. And Mr. DART one time was promised, I was told, that delays could be arranged indefinitely. And then I was told that no, delays <coughs> cannot be arranged. And the other thing is related. Yeah, was he scheduled for the November 19th BZA meeting? Yeah. The other thing that's related to this is, <coughs> I, I could probably go on for two hours about the old village revitalization. But you'll have three minutes, right? Yeah, but I won't. <laughs> But the old village is near and dear to my heart. As it is to everybody. What I don't understand is why the old village review board is being marginalized. I fear that they're going to be marginalized and shoved off to the side. I think they already have been. Where, where are they in this process? Where are they in any of the processes? So there's a big emphasis to bring in the business community, but no emphasis to bring in the people who actually live in the old village, pay taxes in the old village. Originally, it was the old village review, the citizens, and you brought in the business people, everyone together. But we're, we're uh, I'll wrap this up. But we're headed toward a system to where uh, someone said earlier, you know, I think that gentleman did, you know, he made a comment about people from Beaver Creek. We have people from Centerville, we have people from Xenia, we have people from Beaver Creek, we have people from Sugar Creek. We need people from Bellroom. And you're not getting it on these committees. And I do feel the Old Village Review Board is being set up for a fall. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments on open discussion from anyone in the audience on any topic whatsoever? At this time, we'll conclude with comments from council on open discussion. Mr. Edwards? I don't have anything more tonight, Mayor. Thank you. Mr. Greenwood? I'd just uh, like to add that I appreciate everybody coming to this meeting. Uh, this is how democracy works. We discuss, we figure out what's the best way to go. Yeah. We're trying to serve the people, make sure they get what they need and want and uh, try to make everybody happy and something that's going to work. And these types of decisions, like was brought up, like where I live was surveyed in 1844, everything, nothing's changed. Decisions made there may be there for several hundred yeah. years. So uh, it's important that we discuss and we bring up ideas and, and make it right. I appreciate everybody yeah. coming. I echo for us, that's to get input from people um, is what we're here for it and we have to sort it all out and make it work for everyone and not everyone's going to be 100 percent happy um but you do the best you can and and still stay within the legal limits of what we're allowed to do thank you Donna? um i just wanted to welcome mr tuttle to the planning board you yes, obviously you. got your challenges ahead of you <laughs> um based on tonight's discussion um the good news is it's very challenging the bad news is it doesn't pay very well so <laughs> 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 um but uh also th i appreciate everybody coming tonight also and i everybody's been uh very cordial and very mm -hmm. um uh, uh open with their ideas and and i appreciate that um, I also was going to say that uh, this Friday is the, is the last home game for the Belver wow. football team. Already? Yes. Oh, jeez. Yeah. Um, and I think our, our chances, unfortunately, of making the playoffs are very slim. So. Yikes. Yikes. Okay. So that's it. Dr. Van um, Eisen? I'm tickled to see people out here. It's much better in the empty room. Yes. And, <laughs> um, I think also, speaking of democracy, and remembering back to when I moved here 12 years ago, this was the first election I got to vote in, in person, after 26 years active duty. And I think a week from tomorrow there is an election. Correct? Yeah, there is. That's correct. November 5. Thank you. Mr. McGill. 
Uh, interesting day today. I took a field trip. And the field trip had to do with um, emergency weather sirens, potentially for the city. I visited the city of Piketon, Ohio, as well as Central State University, with a representative from uh, American Signal Corporation. American Signal Corporation has been in business since 1942. They, when they first made air raid sirens for civil defense mechanisms here within the states, as well as overseas in, in Britain. And uh, the representative I went with was very encouraging and said that we potentially could put a system into our city here with um, minimal cost. But the neat thing about this is it doesn't have to be um, directly tied to the emergency management system. With your phone now, there's an application that they use in Python that the police car can be driving along and an emergency would come in. The, the <coughs> officer can take his radio, key his radio, and put the application up to it, and a siren will go off. And we'll, and we'll, and we'll, we'll make the notification for mass uh, distribution to the populace. So um, they're, 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 they're known as omnidirectional signals. They operate in a one and a half mile radius uh, for, for the existing uh, uh, siren. Uh, he, fe he felt that for our city, which we looked at today, we probably use two sirens and be very be heard no matter where they were at in, 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 this, in the city here. The other thing that was encouraging was we have an old fireman's siren that uh, apparently was used to alert volunteers to come down to the fire department, fires. Um, he said for several hundred dollars, he was going to give me a direct quote on this, but we probably could take and identify that, put an encoder with that to take on the, just a small area in the village here for, um, for information and sounding for that. So I'm very encouraged with that. Um, he's going to give us a quote. We're going to see what we can do here before we get uh, you know, into severe weather season again back in, back in the spring. So just to let everybody know that that was done. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Glad to have crap. Yeah, it's fine. Uh, I want to thank everybody for attending tonight. It was a good meeting. To the extent you have questions that weren't answered, I would advise you to submit them to city council, submit them to city management staff on the email. We will look into and we get the answers for you. I think we got the right answer on Highview. I know it's not a uh, yes or no that people would want it tonight, but I think it's the best way to go forward. I, I do think the terrain is very steep, and I think it's problematic from that standpoint, so I think we're going the right direction. Tuesday, uh, November the 5th, is an election. It's a very important election for the city of Bellbrook. I would encourage everyone to get out and vote. Does any member of council have any other business to come before this meeting? No. Hearing none, I declare the meeting adjourned. Mm -hmm.